I was actually scheduled to be in Vienna. Uh, unfortunately, I had to cancel last minute because my family got sick. I also wanted to bring my family for the week. So I'm at home in Karlsruhe. Um, um, and um, I'm still glad to give this talk. Um, I try to actually follow the advice of the organizers and try to present an, an, a talk that's you know up for discussion. Uh, so I have certain points that I would have liked to discuss over wine or beer. Uh, that will have to come at some some future time, but so it's 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 more of a of a problem an open ended talk instead of a pure technical talk that I'm that I'm trying to give, and I hope I'm not I'm not going to bore you after lunch. So um, the talk is entitled "Some Aspects of Uncertainty Quantification for Hyperbolic Conservation Laws," and um, I'll basically try to explain you. Um, in, in addition to the general aspects, um, how we computed this result here, it's the flow around an airfoil and an uncertainty quantification uh, of that flow field. So what you see here is I think the variance of the flow field around that airfoil. All right, so um, if you want to understand this example, so, so how, how this has been computed um, and what the uncertainty is. So you see here um, one of these standard airfoils from computational fluid dynamics, from aerodynamics, it's a NACA something airfoil with non-slip boundary conditions. We're solving the compressible Euler equations. And um, there is a flow hitting uh, this airfoil, right? In an angle of attack that's down here with the V infinity flow velocity. And actually um, we're computing this flow field in a huge domain around this airfoil. So that's a zoom in of this thing. And uh, in the simulation results, the, the uncertainty that we considered is the angle of attack. Um, so here it's written out. Um, so it's the steady Euler equations that we consider, um, non-slip boundary conditions and an infinite, uh, uh, essentially a velocity boundary conditions at infinity and an uncertain angle of attack uh, with a certain uh, certain uncertainty. I'm going to say that more often, I think, certain uncertainty um, in the angle of attack, which is, which is written down here. And what we try to determine is the simplest uncertainty quantification for this case to uh, get the expected value of the flow field and the variance as the very basic uh, information about this. And the Mach number here in this case is 0 0.8, so uh, sl slightly subsonic flow. All right, and, and I'll, I'll try to explain to you what we did and how we got this result and why um, it's maybe not such a dumb way to, to, for us to have computed this result. Right, so here's the solution. Um, the expected value you see on the left-hand side, um, what typically happens uh, in the flow around such an airfall is that um, certain structures emerge around the airfall. So you see typically a shock here and a rarefaction wave below the airfoil. Um, and this is kind of mirrored in the variance, which you see on the right-hand side, there's a lot of variance with the shock. So if I move the angle of attack, you can imagine that the shock position vanish, uh, varies. So you see a lot of variance here. And that I think was, was a little bit surprising. You see a lot of variance also in the rarefaction wave down uh, uh, below the airfoil. And uh, not so much variance uh, in front of the airfoil, but um, a lot of density in front of the airfoil. Yeah, so that's the computational result. Um, but the computational result per se is not the interesting thing. Um, it's, it's how we arrived at it. And the important point is, and one of the general problems with hyperbolic conservation laws is that they form these intricate structures, um, discontinuities like a shock, um, rarefaction waves, contact discontinuities and so on that one needs to capture somehow in the numerical method. All right, so um, be before I want to explain this, um, as promised, I wanna make some general points uh, up for discussion. So um, historically, I think many people from kinetic theory or from uh, numerics of kinetic theory, numerics of, of hyperbolic equations were attracted to, to uncertainty quantification. And for me, the starting point was, uh, I believe a talk that Remy Abgral gave, I couldn't find online when that was. So he doesn't have his talk list online anymore, but I guess it was like 
10, 15 years ago, something like this, maybe 10 years ago. And I viewed this as a call of people from the field of kinetic theory to have a look at uncertainty quantification. And you see a lot of things um, that are parallel. And this is an incomplete list. So in kinetic theory, we're, we're trying to describe the dynamics of a probability density function. Yeah, a kinetic equation is typically the master equation of a certain stochastic process. Um, and in UQ, it's, it's about exploring a probability density function now on the, on the space of uncertain parameters. I think kinetic theory people can also relate to the curse of dimensionality. Uh, it's not a hundred dimensions what we're doing, but it's six dimensions plus. So typically three physical dimensions, three dimensions in the velocity or energy domain, time, and maybe some other uh, variables that are in there like particle type, um, other, other things. Um, the Monte Carlo method originally was invented, as far as I know, for a kinetic equation during the Manhattan Project for neutron transport and Metropolis Hastings. Um, the, the, the method that is often used to explore a PDF um, actually was first developed to, to explore the PDF of, 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 of kinetic equations ultimately. Um, and as I've said, the kinetic equation is the master equation of a, of a, of a Markov process. So it's quite natural that there are connections. Um, then stochastic collocation also somehow seems familiar. So in kinetic theory, we discretize the velocity domain. So we have the discrete velocity method, DVM, or in linear transport theory, neutron transport theory, the so-called SN method, which is a collocation method for, for the integral that appears in a kinetic equation. And then finally, that's the thing that uh, I've worked on, moment methods, moment closure. That seems awfully familiar to, to stochastic alert and generalized polynomial chaos. And so in this talk later on, I want to present entropy-based closures for hyperbolic conservation laws, um, but you can think of them as a moment closure method of moments inspired uh, stochastic alert and method. All right, so that's what I wanna present and um, maybe some general things. Um, or from somebody who has learned uncertainty quantification through the literature and through the lens of, of kinetic theory, of computational kinetic theory. So um, the, the first thing I want to bring to your attention is that hyperbolic balance laws, the ones that, I'm, that I want to talk about, are, um, in my opinion, uh, most of the time moment equations themselves. So they are a stochastic Lurkin system, if you wish. So if you write down just a generic kinetic equation here, so uh, the F is the probability density function on phase space, yeah, depending on time, physical space, velocity space. You have the typical advection operator on the left-hand side and you have some kind of scattering operator on the right-hand side, yeah, whatever it is. And then one of the main structural points in kinetic theory is the H theorem, the dissipation of entropy. So we have mathematically speaking, a Lyapunov functional. And the most famous one is the um, uh, F log F entropy density that's, that's due to Boltzmann. So would have liked to be in the Boltzmann lecture hall, obviously. Yeah, so um, an entropy density is a convex functional. So um, in that sense, a specific convex functional for, for the Boltzmann equation. And this is dissipated, yeah? So the, you have this uh, local dissipation law. And if you integrate out the X variable also, you have uh, something that uh, reminds you of the second law of thermodynamics. Yeah? So dt of the entropy, it's advected and it's dissipated by the, by the scattering operator. And I'm gonna use this shorthand notation uh, a couple of times for the velocity integral or the velocity average here. Yeah? So that's a kinetic equation. And what's a moment system? Um, typically one um, multiplies the kinetic equation by polynomials in velocity and integrates them out, yeah? So I have an M of V, which you can imagine to be just polynomials, set of monomials, but also orthogonal polynomials. You multiply this with the probability density function, you get statistical moments with respect to the velocity variable, and that I call U during this talk. So these are my um, physical densities, and examples are the, the mass density, the momentum density, the energy density, and so on. And if I now hit the kinetic equation with this vector m, integrate it out, I get moment equations, uh, which look like this here uh, on, on the abstract level. And uh, what I then need to do, I recognize that um, if I want to view this all as a function of the moments u, which is this left part here, 
I'm left with a so-called closure problem. Maybe I don't know this term exactly because it contains a, a multiplication with velocity. So one higher order moment, which I don't know, which I need to model. And one generic way of modeling it is to say, I model the probability density function as a function of the known moments that I have. So imagine I have mass density, momentum density, energy density. What's my best guess for a probability density function? That's the one I put in here. And formally, I have now a closed system that has a, as its unknown this moment vector u. Uh, and so on an abstract level, it looks like this. Yeah. So I get u here by construction. I get a flux here, which depends on u, and I get a right hand side, which also depends on u. And again, um, one can look at, I think, the literature and the derivation. I would say that many and almost all relevant hyperbolic balance laws are actually moment equations, the most famous example being the Euler equations um, of gas dynamics. Um, and if I construct this moment closure in a way that I'm going to present to you later on, namely by entropy closure, that's the thing that can be done for the Euler equations. These equations inherit uh, the H theorem, so the entropy dissipation principle, and what we automatically get is an entropy entropy flux pair, so eta being the entropy, psi being the entropy flux, uh, which is dissipated again. Um, and as you all well know, is uh, that as I've also said, the solution can form shocks or discontinuities even for smooth initial data. And the entropy is used for many things. And one thing is to select the physically relevant weak solution because for a hyperbolic uh, conservation or balance law, I do not have uniqueness of weak solutions. All right, so, so that's observation number one or discussion point number one that actually hyperbolic balance laws are in a certain sense, a stochastic alerting system where I view the velocity variable as my, um, as my stochastic variable. All right, um, so now coming to the problem formulation and coming to uncertainty quantification. So I take this hyperbolic conservation law, which by itself is a, is a moment equation uh, and add uncertainties to it. So I have an additional variable psi here. And I assume that the uncertainties are parameterized and that they live on the d-dimensional uh, unit cube. And I carry the dimension d because uh, I will talk about the curse of dimensionality as well later on. Yeah, um, and I have initial conditions, boundary conditions that can all, in addition to depending on time and space, depend on this uh, new uh, parameter psi, which is potentially high dimensional. So I'm considering parameter, uh, parameter dependent family of hyperbolic conservation laws. And uh, as I've already said in the beginning, the very, very simplest uncertainty quantification would be to ask for the expected value uh, under these fluctuations and to ask for the variance under these fluctuations or the covariance matrix if it's multidimensional. All right. And the point being, again, um, what makes this interesting and challenging is that the solution is expected to be discontinuous in X psi space. You can easily imagine some examples. Take the linear advection equation here, um, add um, an additional parameter follows some discontinuity and you, you will see that this continuity, if it's a discontinuity in physical space, will also be a discontinuity in random space in this psi variable. All right, so, so that's the problem that I want to consider. And um, before we attack this, I want to um, argue in favor of looking at, at stochastic alerting and moment methods um, in general, because I think the general favorite in uncertainty quantification is non-intrusive methods. So just one slide about this from the point of view of, of numerics, um, all non-intrusive methods are ultimately quadrature rules uh, and they differ in their choice of weights and in their choice of points uh, in this potentially high dimensional space. So uh, you all know this, I think. So here is a Monte Carlo points on the unit cube in 2D. These are some quasi Monte Carlo or in the old literature, number theoretic points. Uh, and these are some, some sparse grids that you might consider. Yeah, so these are non-intrusive methods which you can certainly use and which you certainly should compare against. Now, what I want to, what I want to use is moment methods. Um, so in the language of uncertainty quantification, they are intrusive stochastic alerting methods. 
And I also don't have to explain them. They have appeared in the previous talks and they will appear again. Um, Generalized polynomial chaos is a fancy term for just an expansion in orthogonal polynomials uh, that fit the probability density function. Uh, I plug this into the equation. The equation has a residual and I demand this residual to be orthogonal to the ansatz space. And I get uh, this system here in general uh, and I've zeroed out the right-hand side. So I don't have balance laws anymore, but conservation laws. And formally, uh, what I've derived is a coupled set of partial differential equations for the expansion coefficients. Um, so one remark already here, uh, the moment method presents this uh, historically in the different way. So we first take the moments, the thing you do in the second step when you project the residual to the orthogonal of the ansatz space and then reconstruct. Galerkin classically puts in an ansatz and then projects but in certain cases, the result that you get is the same thing. Yeah. So in that sense, the moment method is stochastic lurking, explained the other way around. All right, but so, so coming back to, to hyperbolic conservation laws, th there is a problem with the stochastic lurking method, namely that there is no reason why the stochastic lurking system should be hyperbolic. I, I did not explain hyperbolicity. Um, so I should do it now. Hyperbolicity means that the Jacobian of the flux function um, is a real diagonalizable, um, which means that I can construct a solution by individual waves. Yeah? And uh, even if the Jacobian of the flux matrix is real diagonalizable, if I now take the Jacobian of this big system that I have, now not just the physical variables anymore, but in addition, um, these stochastic components. So I put this all into a big system. I have a big Jacobian, there is no reason why this Jacobian matrix should be real diagonalizable. Um, you can imagine it to consist of copies of modified versions of the Jacobian of the original system, all filled in blocks. Um, and you can, you can try for yourself to figure out if, if, you, if you can construct a, a diagonalization from the, from the diagonalization of the original flux matrix and you will fail. Um, so that's why I'm saying there's no reason why this system should be hyperbolic. And in general, it's not. You observe this except for some special cases that you don't have a well post system ultimately. Yeah, so plain vanilla stochastic alerkin doesn't work for um, a nonlinear hyperbolic system uh, of conservation laws. So you need to do something else. Um, but before we go to that, the next discussion point um like a like a general general observation the curse of dimensionality i mentioned um ultimately if you compare all of these methods that were on on the slide two slides ago they are all quadrature rules as i've said or can be interpreted as quadrature rules um, except for stochastic lurking and if i compare them and that's what's usually done in the literature you compare them by the total number of evaluations of the of the forward model that you have that's capital n they compare like this. And the typical definition of the curse of dimensionality is to look at the convergence rate, right? And for example, for a tensorized grid, we will see this. I have a co convergence rate that depends not in a good way on the dimension D. And it's, it's said that this suffers from the curse of dimensionality because if I do this in high dimensions, then this looks really, really bad. Um, there's a lot to say, I think, about these error estimates, which are down here. So uh, Monte Carlo, quasi Monte Carlo sparse grids. Um, the one, the, the two things that I want to say uh, from a practical perspective is that um, what, what confuses many of my students, I think, if one says Monte Carlo does not suffer from the curse of dimensionality and one means that the convergence rate doesn't depend on the dimensionality, that doesn't mean that Monte Carlo is a good method. Um, so there is a very simple random experiment that, that I show to my students is approximating the volume of the d-dimensional unit sphere. You can imagine you sample Monte Carlo points on the d-dimensional unit cube. You can decide if the point is inside the unit sphere or not. And uh, the ratio of the points that are inside the sphere to the total number of points will approximate the volume of the unit sphere. And what is shown here is an experiment uh, for 10 and 20 dimensions, up to 100 million samples. And what is plotted here, so only this one line, is the relative error uh, of Monte Carlo in 20 dimensions. And you see that it's one 
which means that Monte Carlo is completely useless um, for, 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 for this experiment. So just volume of the unit sphere, 20 dimensions, 100 million points. And the reason is, of course, that the, the unit sphere is really, really tiny in high dimensions. Yeah, But I think that that statement should, should be taken with a grain of salt that Monte Carlo does not suffer from the curse of dimensionality. Yeah? It's, it's, it's useless in 20 dimensions in, in this case. Um, another general remark, again, for, for a discussion over beer, actually, um, one often sees that, I think, in the kinetic theory literature that people say, I want to use stochastic Malerkin because of the spectral convergence. Um, the, the truth is that Gauss quadrature and clenshaw curtis quadrature also show spectral convergence. Surprisingly, this was shown only 10 years ago. One would have thought that one knows everything about quadrature. The real reason, um, in my opinion, from a practical point of view, it, that favors stochastic Lurkin over sparse grids and clenshaw curtis at, at the heart of sparse grids and the fast convergence of sparse grids is that actually you win by a little bit. Yeah, so there's uh, in the error estimates a factor of two to the L with the level L. And if you put a table together of the polynomial dimension of, you know, the number of polynomials you would have to use for stochastic Lurkin, the number of points you would have in a sparse grid and the number of tensor points, you see that there is somewhat of an advantage of, uh, of stochastic Lurkin over sparse grids. Not asymptotically, but um, um, significant, yeah, if you, if you want to do practical computations. All right, and well, they, they deal with the same uh, set of polynomial uh, ansatz space, actually. All right, so having, having made these, these, these general remarks, I, I would want to, to argue to um, consider a practical curse of dimensionality or a definition of a curse of dimensionality in practice, which would be to consider the epsilon cost of a numerical method, including uh, the constant that's, that's in the error estimate. I know that's, that's hard to achieve theoretically, but for practical purposes, one should actually do that. Um, and I have some remarks about quasi Monte Carlo as well. You can ask me later if, if, if there's time. All right, so um, wh why stochastic Lurkin then? Yeah, so having said all this, having made these, these general remarks, um, the advantage of, of Monte Carlo and stochastic collocation are that they are embarrassingly parallel, right? If you implement this, um, you can just, if you have 1 million processes, let them all run one simulation and then aggregate your statistics afterwards. They use existing code, whereas stochastic Lurkin requires changes into the code. They do have the same convergence order, both spectral potentially, if things are smooth. Um, and uh, the stochastic Lurkin system, however, is, is, is most likely not hyperbolic. Yeah? In, in all the, the relevant cases, it's not. Uh, so that speaks against stochastic Lurkin. What, what speaks in favor of stochastic Lurkin is the thing that I've, that I've said. Um, you have less unknowns than a sparse grid. A factor of four or factor of eight or 16 can be significant in, in, in practice. Um, and then a point which is, which is a bit, bit fuzzy. Um, from experience, often the expected value um, of the solution of a hyperbolic kinetic, uh, of a hyperbolic um, equation is often smoother than U itself, right? So um, in, in U, I have discontinuities, I have shocks, and you can imagine that if I put some uncertainty on the initial conditions that my shock would smear out as well. So the idea is, or the hope is, that the solution is actually is actually smoother, which means I don't need shock capturing, I don't need limiters, and all of the things that make uh, hyperbolic equations hard. Um, that cannot be proven in general. I don't know if Christoph Schwab is in the audience. I think he's in the workshop. There's a paper by Schwab and Mishra which studies this problem, and of course you can construct examples where the expected value is not smoother than you and and, and shows a shock. But in practice. Uh, you can hope for the expected value of u being smoother than u. So if, uh, if I approximate the expected value directly, I can hope that I can do this uh, with a cheaper numerics, actually, a cheaper space-time numerics. Then the thing that I want to talk a little bit about is uh, you, can, you can use adaptivity, right? A, um, a non-intrusive method tensorizes, in a certain sense, the forward solve of the equation and the uncertainties. 
So if you leave everything in one system, you can use uncertainty in, in physical space and in the, in the random space together, right? And, and hope you can save there. And there's other tricks you can use that I'm not going to talk about only if you, only if you ask me about it, you can iterate faster into steady space and use, use some other tricks to make uh, stochastic lurking competitive. And that's what we're trying to do here. Um, and what I want to talk about now is entropy-based stochastic lurking. And the, the problem that I want to address is the lack of hyperbolicity, right, that I mentioned. And there's a way to fix this. And it's, it's a way that's inspired by kinetic theory. And it works like this. So, um, so look at your uncertain um, hyperbolic equation. So here it is again. And uh, we imagine Xi is, is a random variable, actually parameterized. And we have a probability density function against which we want to, want to integrate over, over Xi. Yeah, so here is the system. And what I then do, I explain this in the kinetic theory way. So I do the projection first. Yeah, in Galerkin, you would do the projection on the orthogonal complement of the residual second. I do this first, I take moments. Yeah, so I multiply this equation by certain ansatz functions, phi i. They might be the orthonormal polynomials associated with the probability density function, but they might also be something else. And I integrate against the probability density function and I get statistical moments. Yeah, so you can imagine them to be, again, one psi, psi squared or something that gives you the covariance matrix. Um, so that's what I do here. So um, again, using my notation here, this time for um, Xi integrals over the probability density function by these brackets here. And I can then multiply my equation up here with the basis functions. Yeah, so I take my projection first and integrate over Xi and then I get a, then I get a so-called moment system. And um, the thing that I get by construction in the front is the moment vector. So if I collect everything that by construction, it contains all the moments, which I label U, not hat up to you and hat. And I collect all of my uh, ansatz basis functions, the polynomials, if you wish, in, in a vector that I call phi. All right. And in the explanation of, of, of the Galerkin method of, of kinetic theory, now would be the time to think of an ansatz. And that's what I do. And for here, this is supposed to be generic. I come up with some way of saying u is now a function that I call curly capital U of the moments you had. And this I plug into here, the term that I don't know. Yeah. So because this is nonlinear, there is certainly some terms in here in the integration that I cannot express directly um, by, by the moments that I collected in U hat. All right. And now I'm in, I'm in my kinetic theory uh, playing field and I can use what's there. And um, the simplest one, stochastic Lurkin, vanilla stochastic Lurkin is also present in kinetic theory. I mentioned this uh, in transport theory, it's called the PN method, which simply assumes that uh, my reconstruction is a polynomial. Yeah? So I say my best guess uh, for U is actually um, U hat transpose times phi, which is the sum of the UI with phi I, which is a polynomial ansatz. Yeah, which is the equivalent of stochastic Lurkin. And again, in transport theory, we call this the PN method. But now there's, this has the issues of, hyper, of, of non-hyperbolicity. Now there's something else which guarantees the hyperbolicity. And this has entered the field of uncertainty quantification under the name of intrusive polynomial moment method. It was invented by Poet de and Lucor uh, already more than 10 years ago. Um, it reconstructs uh, the uh, unknown as the solution of an optimization problem. So I'm saying my best possible reconstruction given certain moments is that I minimize the entropy. Uh, so I'm always speaking about mathematical entropy, which the case in the second law of thermodynamics. So I minimize the entropy under the constraint that I reproduce the moments. Um, so actually one other way of viewing stochastic Lurkin uh, is if I wrote, if I use the entropy uh, L2, so this is U squared, then I also get this projection here. But in general, I would use the entropy of my um, hyperbolic conservation law and say I reconstruct 
by unknown in this way. And in transport theory, this is from which this in intrusive polynomial moment method was inspired. This is called the MN method. Um, and it's actually uh, now more than 30 years old, 35 years old. All right. Um, so what, what's left to show you is that, well, entropy comes into the picture, but why does this solve this problem of, of non-hyperbolicity? And let me explain you what it does. So now uh, the intrusive polynomial moment method puts this reconstruction into the equations. The reconstruction comes from this constraint optimization problem, minimize the entropy under the constraint that I reproduce the moment. So look for the best possible reconstruction measured by the entropy. And then uh, I can solve this formally at least. Yeah, so I don't want to go through the nitty gritty details but it's actually a calculus one or two topic uh, constraint optimization. You put down a Lagrangian. That's why you uh, obtain a Lagrange multiplier. And uh, you can obtain the, the optimizer, uh, the minimizer in this case by the Legendre dual, uh, the derivative of the Legendre dual evaluated at the Lagrange multiplier uh, times the polynomial ansatz basis. And the Lagrange multiplier now solves an unconstrained dual problem, which I've written down here. Yeah, so um, that's standard standard optimization theory. The point being that this comes from the adjoint method um, and I'm solving an unconstrained dual problem um, to get the reconstruction. And I, want to in I wanted to introduce the Lagrange multiplier and give you a glimpse of this um, because if I write now the system in terms of the Lagrange multiplier, I see that the system is in Friedrich's form and therefore hyperbolic. So here again is um, my hyperbolic uh, moment system, stochastic Lurkin system. So everything integrated against phi. And if I now write my reconstruction like this, it's the Legendre dual, which by the way, for the F log F entropy is just the exponential. So you can imagine the exponential of a polynomial here. It contains the Lagrange multiplier at this place and at this place. And if I differentiate everything out, um, I have to do this by the chain rule uh, in, in the first term and in the second term. And I realize that this is Friedrich's form, meaning I have a symmetric positive definite matrix multiplying the time derivative and a symmetric matrix multiplying the spatial derivative. Um, and because of the convexity of the entropy, uh, actually this is symmetric positive definite. And therefore the system is guaranteed to be hyperbolic. Yeah? So by construction, taking the entropy of the original hyperbolic conservation law, using this intrusive polynomial moment method, I can construct a system that is by construction hyperbolic. And so overcomes this, this problem of non-hyperbolicity in vanilla standard stochastic alert. All right, I hope this wasn't too fast. Uh, that you got that you got the main idea in, in, in all of this sometimes a bit tedious notation. All right, um, so there, there is an honest truth about this that needs to be mentioned. This method is expensive um, because in every spatial cell, in every time step, you actually need to solve one of these problems, right? So I have this system here and I always, so imagine I propagate this, right? So down here, I have a finite volume method. I propagate moments between cells in some way. Then I have the moments in a cell. I need to reconstruct uh, my, uh, my, my reconstruction for the flux in every cell, meaning I have to solve these unconstrained optimization problems. Then I have the reconstruction. I can compute uh, the moments again. I can compute fluxes. And so I can run this, this whole scheme. Yeah, but in, it involves, that's important to note, a numerical integration in every cell typically, right? Imagine the exponential of a higher order polynomial. I cannot do this on paper anymore. I need to use a quadrature rule. And this needs to be done in every time step for every random component, but at least embarrassingly parallel. Yeah, so I can do this in every computational cell separate from the other computational cells. And that's actually a good thing for modern high performance computers. Yeah, so this has been implemented on graphic cards uh, and it brings an acceleration because you can do a lot of local computations and you have limited 
um, exchange of communication between the cells, which is which is good for, for HPC systems. All right, but still, it's an expensive method. All right, before I come to the to the numerical results, um, let me highlight one thing about many things that you can do, and one thing that we actually did, uh, like a tiny improvement over the original IPM uh, method. Uh, that's related to kinetic theory. So um, what you can do for scalar hyperbolic uh, conservation laws, uh, you're free to choose the entropy actually. So every convex functional is an entropy in that case. So for instance, you can enforce a maximum principle uh, through the entropy. And uh, that's good to mitigate oscillations, which I will explain in a second. And the original paper of uh, Poet des Prions du Corps had this, entropy, which um, in optimization is known as the log barrier entropy. Um, and what we have shown is uh, that it's better to use a kinetic entropy, which we know from uh, fermions actually. So it's the Fermi entropy or a modified version of it, which uh, does not allow you to go below this U minus state and above this U plus state. And it's a smoother version actually of this entropy does the same job. And if you look, uh, and I hope you can see this, it's not too small. This is um, a problem with, you know, two shocks here. Uh, this being, you know, inspired by a spectral method, you know, expansion in polynomials is prone to oscillations, right? And that's what the log barrier entropy does. It doesn't oscillate below the lower bound and above the upper bound, that's, that's handled by the entropy. So it doesn't oscillate a lot here, but it oscillates at this double shock. Um, and actually the kinetic entropy um, because of its behavior um, has, has, has less oscillations in, in this case. Yeah, so this has been done uh, with, with low order polynomials in order to see or not see the oscillations. Yeah, so choosing the entropy inspired by kinetic theory in this case. Um, yeah, some numerical results. Uh, so um, coming back to the setup, um, so this is this uh, NACA0012 profile that I showed in the beginning. Uh, this is the computational grid. So it's an irregular triangular grid. It's been refined by hand. So you see a lot of fine grid cells around the airfoil and where we expect to see the shock. Yeah, so this has been done a priori. And it's been done in a huge domain containing about 20 something thousand uh, triangular elements. The code is unfortunately only a first order code or was a first order code at that time. Uh, the optimization problems, the quadrature that we need to do, and the updates in random space are parallelized with MPI. Yeah, ultimately, this is embarrassingly parallel. I just need to collect all the information uh, after a step. Uh, and we have an open NP parallelization in space. Uh, so this can be distributed across, across the course of a node. And um, I mentioned one of the points uh, that speaks in favor of uh, doing an intrusive stochastic lurkin like methods is that we can use adaptivity. And I'm not explaining this here because I think you all know how, how adaptivity works. It relies on an error estimator. So this is our, our kind of um, uh, error indicator where, should, where we should do a refinement in, in, the, in the random space. So we adaptively refine at every spatial cell separately in random space according to an indicator which tells us if if our expansion is enough whether we should you know have more polynomials or we, whether we should have less polynomials and we've taken an error indicator from the from the CFD literature um, for this case all right um, so here's the solution again um, as i've said um, typically at this point a shock forms and down here is a rarefaction like wave you already see that the, the shock is a little bit smeared out in the expected value that I see here. So this is actually kind of a not smooth transition, but at least a continuous transition. Uh, and uh, what you also see is at the shock position, uh, the uncertainty of the angle of attack kicks in. So uh, we, have a, we have a variance here at, at this shock position, which is kind of the most prominent feature um, in this solution. All right, so taking a look, what does the adaptivity do here? Um, I would say it does what it's expected to do and it always gives pretty pictures. So what you see here in this, in this color plot is um, the uh, number of moments for this one dimensional uncertainty quantification, so one dimensional random space 
So we have three, four, five, up to 10 moments, depending on the color. So black, um, we do with zero moments actually. So there's no uncertainty whatsoever, which kind of far away from the airfoil is actually, actually true. Uh, and you see that the error indicator has a lot of refinement in an uncertain space where the variance is high in the shock region and where the variance is also high here. Yeah. So it, it kind of does what it's supposed to do. Um, and you can kind of guess that there is some savings here. So there's a lot of cells that are reduced to a very low order expansion here. So only three moments or four moments in the vast majority of the computational grid. And there's a, then there's very little in the intermediate polynomials, I would say. And then in the highest polynomial in the interesting regions where actually the structure in the solution forms. So there's a significant number of cells where we have the fully refined, um, fully refined random space in our example. And we stopped at, at polynomial degree 10, or po polynomial degree nine, which means 10 moments. All right, so what about, what about the computations? Well, um, in this one-dimensional example, um, we put in all the tricks we had actually. So uh, you see this in this acronym, the adaptivity isn't just, just one of them. There's a realizability fix and there is um, something we call one shot to speed up the optimization, uh, uh, the, um, the um, iteration into equilibrium. And if we do this, you see the blue line is kind of our best shot. You see the convergence behavior in terms of runtime. Yeah, so here's the error. It's a relative L2 error uh, in the solution. You follow the blue curve and it saturates here in this implementation at around 25,000 seconds at, at that error level, which is I think um, five times 10 to the minus, no, actually 0.5 times 10 to the minus three, something like this. It should be, no, 1.5 10 to the minus three. And you can kind of see that having all these tricks uh, put in, uh, we can beat the stochastic collocation method uh, that gives us the same error in the end. Yeah, so this would here be a stochastic collocation method uh, with uh, 17, uh, with a polynomial degree 17 um, or, or 17 quadrature points. Um, and well, if you want to go to a lower um, what you see here, so, so you see stochastic collocation methods with, with lower degrees. Um, if you are fine with this accuracy, then actually you find a stochastic collocation method which beats this one. Um, but then again, we could also um, decrease the accuracy of this intrusive polynomial moment method with adaptivity um, 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 built in here. Yeah, so. Um, we barely beat, in this case at least, the stochastic collocation method. I remind you, though, it's a one-dimensional example, so we hope that we can beat it in a clearer way in multiple dimensions. So that's my conclusion. Um, I hope I could convince you that intrusive stochastic alerting methods are worthwhile if you consider them for the right reasons and if you put in all your bag of tricks. Um, this intrusive polynomial moment method has uh, nice properties, well posedness properties, but it's very expensive. So you need to also care about the implementation. Uh, I think you need to use all the tricks that you have. Adaptivity is something we call one shot um, for, for the dual problem. Um, and what I think is still an open problem in, in hyperbolic conservation laws is ensuring and utilizing the smoothness of the statistical moments. Yeah, so how can I tell if my uh, statistical moments are actually smooth and what can I do um, in terms of switching off, you know, uh, high order, complicated stabilized numerics at the shocks. And then the other point, I think there's lots of connections between kinetic theory and uncertainty quantification. I think um, some, 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 some inspiration for discussions that hyperbolic conservation laws are actually stochastic alerting systems in a way, many UQ methods originally were invented for the transport equations, but by now I would say that UQ methods have overtaken the original method. So I think there should be a flow back of uh, modern UQ methods into computational kinetic theory. So with that, thanks a lot.